He's an alumni of Leadership Metro Richmond's class of 2011. He received Style Weekly's Top 40 Under 40 Award in 2010, and he's still killing it seven years later. Style Weekly Power List in 2014 and 2015. He served as inaugural director of the Harding Street Urban Agricultural Center, which is a recreation center repurposed into an indoor farm by Virginia State University. And currently, he serves as community engagement coordinator for Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden. My man, good to have you here. Stage is yours. All right, all right. Let's see. How's everybody doing? All right, so um, let's see if this works. Boom. All right, so um, today's topic is taboo. And I really appreciated the opportunity to share with this theme in mind. It was, an, it was ambiguous enough that I could um, really fit a lot of my personal narrative into the story. So we're just gonna go through this arc, right? It's uh, gonna be kind of nonlinear and I'm gonna be giving you some examples of, you know, what it means for me to be controversial, what it means for me to speak truth, and what it means to live in a world of alternate facts. <laughs> All right. So welcome to Richmond, Virginia, for those who are new to the area, for those who are um, what I like to say, been here, um, you should let your new neighbors know about our schizophrenia. <laughs> it's a tale of two cities, the sixth best city for families, but 41% of the children in the city live in poverty. And a recent study said that this is the awesome place for foodies, right? You know, all these restaurants, craft breweries, awesome place to eat but it's got mad food deserts, right? Nowhere, uh, places where you have no grocery store within a mile or more of residence, right? I was born here, right? I'm a native, I'm from Southside, right? Um, I went to school here, high school, but um, the kind of story I'm gonna talk to you about today is how telling the truth in a world of alternate facts is a revolutionary act. And, you know, alternate facts didn't uh, all of a sudden appear, right? This is not a new thing. All of us now are kind of like, whoa, like they're just gonna outright lie to us. Well, I live in a world where there's been lies told all my life, right? Uh, the dominant narrative for people of African ancestry is predominantly one of lies, whitewashing, you know, these up, up uh, what do you call it? Uh, obscure, uh, ob I don't know the word. What? There we go. I can't pronounce it, I'm, I'm tough. Uh, just these, you know, total obliterations of what really happened from indigenous people to people of African ancestry to Asians, to immigrant communities, this total, you know, ignorance of the real world. I was born in the 80s, 1980. Uh, my mother was from Rough and Row. My father was from Davy Gardens. Davy Gardens sits on the side of Rough and Row. My mom and my dad met, they like teenagers. She's like 17, my dad's like 16. But my dad was, at the age of 16, a venture capitalist. He um, managed a startup fund of six figures. Um, he had, his, his area of investment was urban pharmacology. Um, he had a master's in hustlenomics. Um, and, and, and very much so, you know, he, uh, made a lot of money at an early age and wasn't really so keen on getting married and locking down and having a family, right? Because of these realities. And we talk about, you know, crack in a community in the 80s. Richmond was no different than many other major metropolitan cities where you had these huge inf uh, infusion of illicit narcotics into concentrated poverty areas, right? 
So we like to tell ourselves this story about dope dealers, that they're villains and somehow they're evil, right? That there's something you know, morally corrupt with those who decide that their only reality is that I'm going to you know, enter into the market and be the truest of truest capitalists and engage in the market of supply and demand and free trade and all that different type of stuff. But as soon as we put drugs in the conversation, it's like, oh my God, these guys, there's something wrong with them, right? <laughs> but um, my dad was no villain, but he was no hero either, right? He's a victim of his circumstance. You know, he was born in an area where there were no job opportunities. So, you know, what was gonna make the most money? was him packaging crack rocks. Um, when my mom uh, decided that she wanted to start a family and wasn't gonna chase after my dad anymore, uh, <laughs> she got married. And I was blessed to you know, leave Richmond, Virginia because uh, my mom married a military guy. Um, my stepfather, would, took us to Hanau, Germany, right? And so from the age of four to 12 years old, I lived overseas, right? I went to Department of Defense schools, and I always tell people that Department of Defense invests in their children like they're gonna be the next generals of you know, the country or what have you. So I grew up in an area where you know, I didn't see the disparity between whites and blacks. I'm in, you know, a whole nother country. I grew up around Asians, indigenous people, you know, white folks, black folks, kids with special ed. And I tell people all the time, as a little kid that was in special ed, he had like the Olympic medals. And I was like, yeah, I want an Olympic medal. Like, I want to go to the Special Olympics too. How can I get a Special Olympics? <laughs> so um, that whole idea of inclusion was inherent in my early early years. But when I came back to Richmond, you know, we were smack back dab in Southside again. My grandma died and it brought us back to um, Richmond. And because I had grew up in this environment where there was such a heavy push on education, I didn't know nothing about hip hop. I think I had, my first album was like, um, the first rap album I bought was like Run DMC, um, walk this way, you know, with the, with the song. Uh, <laughs> Mary, Mary, how many of you remember saying, Mary, Mary, I, I bought that album. Uh, uh, but we didn't have TV in, in Germany, there was only one channel and they played the same thing every day, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, I read a lot as a kid, so I came back to the States and they were like, yo, you talk white. And I was like, yo, what? Like, I don't understand what is talking white, right? because I read books, I have a different level of vocabulary. This is me at 12, 13 years old in sixth grade coming back to the state. So this immediate, you know, othering because of, you know, intellectual capacity or what have you was a reality that I faced coming up in um, Southside. And it would be a thing that, you know, would push me into a different direction from a lot of my peers, right? Because I was cool with who I was, but at the same time, you had to acculturate and connect to you know, your surroundings. Not to mention, again, my dad and his startup capital uh, venture um, made him a very popular guy <laughs> throughout uh, the city. And so, you know, my little nerdy, book reading self, you know, my dad is like the plug for, <laughs> for all these areas of Southside. So I go to school and instead of getting picked on, you know, I'm getting like special treatment, like, oh, this is Icky's son, right? Um, I'm riding with my dad and I've seen people's moms that are strung out are my dad's customers, right? So it's a different type of relationship when you go to school and you know somebody's mom's addicted to dope, right? They, they, they don't pick on you the same kind of way, right? <laughs> it's like, well, you might, you know, divulge what my mom was on, on the other day. Fast forward, you know, I go through high school. I'm aspiring to be a rapper and all this different type of stuff. Um, you know, I'm smoking a lot of weed. You know, this is just a byproduct of just being in the community, right? 
um, around my peers, and our rapping and weed smoke had uh, converged at one night into us going to a block party. And I remember this night vividly. Um, during this time of my life, I was challenging a lot of ideas about religion. You know, my mom, my dad, my mom, when she, when my grandmother passed, she made us go to church. I didn't grow up in the church, but she said, hey, you know, I'm getting saved, Holy Ghost Jesus, I'm about to anoint your head with oil, and we're going to church every Saturday, every Wednesday, and every Monday. And I was like, God, no, I don't want to do this. No, 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 this is not going to work for me. And because of that resistance, it caused me to read more about Christianity, about Western ideas of religion. So I'm challenging this whole notion, not so much because I want to get closer to God, but because I don't want to go get up on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. So I'm like, you know, why or do we believe this idea that, you know, Adam and Eve and the Bible and all this type of stuff and I'm reading about Buddhism, and I'm reading about Islam, and I'm reading about metaphysics, and I'm reading about Greek mythology, and you know, the Vedas, and Bahava Gita, and you know, I'm engaging in these uh, spiritual conversations with myself as a challenge to my mom's you know, indoctrination into the Christian church. So the night that I got shot at the block party, you know, I was in the mindset of like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not believing in Jesus as the savior of my, and redeemer of my sins. I'm like, you know, if I was in Asia and indigenous to an Asian country and I knew nothing of Jesus, I should not have to go to hell as a result, right? So that night, I'm having all these gut feelings as to not go to this block party. And, you know, my friend, he comes, he drives up, um, and he's like, yo, we're going to the party, man. We got to go. We're going to get on the microphone. And I'm like, well, I don't really want to go home, right? I really want to go home. But I had already had some premonitions earlier from another conversation. Somebody said, hey, man, wouldn't it be messed up if somebody pulled out an SK and just shot up everything? And I was like, you know, yeah, that would be kind of messed up. <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason, it terrified me, right? Like, in that moment when he said it, it like sent shudders through my body. And I'm having this premonition, and you know, my friend's like, let's go to the block party. I'm like, nah, I really wanna go home. Um, he's like, man, you gotta go. I'm like, all right, okay, I'm gonna go. And we go, and the whole time I'm in the back seat of the car feeling sick. You know, like this pit, stomach feeling, like, oh God. I don't know why I'm doing, but I'm gonna go. So we go to the party. We get there, a guy um, has an argument in the front of the uh, house. They wouldn't let him in. We picked up probably about a caravan of people on the way, so I'm sure that this um, birthday party we were going to was like, yo, there's a lot of people from Southside in the front. We don't know if we wanna let all of them in. And he gets into an argument, they wouldn't let him in. He goes back to the trunk of his car, pops the trunk and pulls out a SK semi-automatic Russian rifle, depicted here. This is not the same gun, because the one that I was shot with was, uh, had a broken handle. Um, he pulls it out and opens fire in front of the block party, right? I'm standing in the driveway and, you know, you ever see the movie The Matrix? when Neo like does the little, right, and the bullets are going slow. Like that happened to me, right? In the moment that the, the barrel of the gun exploded its first slug, I saw the orange and blue shooting out the barrel in slow motion. So it's like, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and I started running, right? Um, you know, I didn't know I was shot when I first got shot, but it went through my leg, I got the scars, it went through my leg, I got a, a bullet fragment in my knee, and I got, a, um, I got hit in my wrist. The night of the shooting was a girl's birthday party. She got shot in the heart. Um, and I was in the ER. Um, you know, my friends would rush to the ER, Chippenham Hospital. I'm in the triage, and I hear the dee, dee, dee for the girl 
whose birthday it was. And, you know, my mom, oh my God. I mean, the most guttural sound that you can ever imagine. So I say all that to say, like, I was challenging God and the idea of God, right? At that moment, the night I, was got, I, sh I got shot. But I didn't die. So I said, hmm, you know, I'm still alive for a reason, right? Like there's something in this space. Somebody else didn't make it tonight. One guy got shot in the face. Another girl got shot in the heart. The girl got shot in the heart. Somebody else, it's like three people died and like five other people got injured that night. And so the fact that I survived made me think like, yo, there's got to be a bigger purpose for me. I remember the guy from church coming. He's like, man, thank Jesus that you, you know, praise Jesus. And I was like, man, at that moment, I was like, thank Buddha or Allah or Yahweh, whoever you want to call him, because I'm still here. And, you know, that idea of pushing a truth and feeling connected to a truth would always kind of resonate throughout my narrative. Um, Audrey Lord says, I began to ask each time, what's the worst that could happen to me if I tell this truth? And that would be a guiding principle throughout my adult years. Um, in 2003, I started a festival called Happily Natural Day. Happily Natural Day um, was created with the idea of challenging Eurocentric standards of beauty. As a result of slavery and colonization, the dominant narrative has been that white people are the standard and the hierarchy of human values includes white folks at the top and people of color at the bottom, black people at the very bottom and the gradient you know, in between, depending on who you ask. So we did the first Happily Natural Day challenging this idea of good hair versus bad hair. You know, if you got good hair, your hair is straight and wavy and it's easy to get a comb through. If it's bad, then it's tightly knit, tightly curly. You know, if you're um, extremely dark, then, you know, you might not be able to access certain rooms. This idea of colorism, the lighter your skin is, you have higher levels of access into the uh, halls of white you know, uh, the white establishment, you know, um, we just created this festival to celebrate the idea of blackness and challenge the ideas of inferiority complexes in the black community. What that opened up for me was a Pandora's box, right? Because it's deeper than just superficial aesthetics. These ideas of inferiority play out in terms of, you know, do I support a black business, right? Or do I feel like all black businesses maybe got like poor service because they're black, right? Or this idea that, you know, I go into my community and my front yard doesn't have grass, right? Is there something connected to my self-identity that is reflected in the quality of my living environment? You know, when I started Happily Natural Day, you know, it was an amazing ride. You know, we had so many successes early on, you know, back picture, you see all these amazing articles that come up, but it did not come without challenges. Um, and I learned that once you start to speak, people will yell at you, you know, they will interrupt you, they will put you down, you know, they'll suggest it's personal, but the world won't end, right? So standing clear on these truths and these principles and these ideas, um, would only be undergirded in the face of the adversities that we would um, meet up with. Certain opportunities would jump up and we would have to get really blatant and really brash with our truth, right? In 2007, I don't know if many of you remember, but that was the uh, year that the General Assembly uh, issued a statement of profound regret um, regarding slavery, right? we call it bullshit, and we said, <laughs> regret isn't enough. Um, they uh, unveiled, hoping the cities had unveiled this huge statue at the corner of uh, Maine, and um, I don't know, down there by the Main Street Station. And um, you know, the sea of people like, oh, happy, oh yes, profound regret, and we're going to reconcile, you know, all of the evils of slavery. And I was like, yo, the state assembly just said they, they didn't apologize. They say they regret profoundly that slavery happened. I said, look, man, regret is not enough. 
put your money where your mouth is, right? And the sea of people at the unveiling of the statue, I'm the only person there holding this sign up. <laughs> and it was so weird because people were like, like, you had that picture up? They were like this. <laughs> Little guy, white guy comes up to me, I agree with you. Oh, yeah. Uh, also that year uh, was uh, the 400-year uh, anniversary of Jamestown, right? So there was a concert that took place at the Sugar Pad and um, to, like, commemorate it, right? Um, and we called bullshit on that, too. There was, um, they, had the, they had the ships to reenact, to reenact, you know, the settlers coming into, you know, Virginia. And, you know, there was a happy engagement with, like, the Powhatan Indians and everybody had a good time. It's like, man, this is a celebration of 400 years of terrorism, right? You know, tell the truth about Jamestown, right? Celebrating genocide and slavery, right? Because that was that moment when those settlers hit the shores where things could have went an entirely different way, right? It could have been about equity and unity and cooperation and collaboration, but instead it was like smallpox blankets and like, no, you live here, but we're gonna kill you because we want your land and we're gonna kidnap your daughter. And you know, she's getting married across the water with John Rolfe and all this stuff. Um, so we took these signs, I made these signs, again, the sign thing. Uh, 400 years of terrorism, tell the truth about Jamestown. We're at the concert with these signs and we had t-shirts on that said, tell the truth about Jamestown. Go out, had like 20, 30 shirts. So as soon as we hit the um, concert, we're giving out the t-shirts. They had the roots perform at the concert to kind of like make it urban, <laughs> right? So we reached out to Quest Love, right, from the roots and was like, yo, Quest love, they're trying to put okie doke, they just want this to look like all black people are happy about Jamestown. Like, you know, how can you support? He's like, yo, give me a shirt. So we get a shirt to uh, Quest Love, he throws the shirt on, he's drumming with the shirt, and at the end of the show, they, he makes this statement about how the roots don't, you know, support <laughs> genocide or slavery, and that, you know, Jamestown was that moment where things could, it was just illustrious, and then they go into Masters of the Universe. Um, it was just surreal. Um, but the reactions to the sign were also surreal. I had a little white guys like, what you, yeah. I'm like, what? Like, you know, just because of a sign, like, it caught, we didn't say anything, just 400 years of terrorism, tell the truth about Jamestown. I got three minutes? Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Food access and urban agriculture. Fast forward. We get into the food access conversation. Challenging narratives about paternalism, working with the community instead of doing four, shutting down paternalism every chance we got. You know, got tired of seeing, you know, white organizations with the little black kids in the front and, you know, they're giving all the money, all the food to the kids, but ain't no black people in the leadership, ain't no black people on the board, it's no black adult and interaction in the situation at all. We're like, yo, we need to work with the community to empower the community truly and give the people in the community a voice instead of, you know, jumping on the nonprofit industrial complex. You know, um, I built an urban farm, an indoor farm in Southside, right down the street, uh, I mean, uh, Petersburg, right down the street from the crack house, $1.5 million budget. The guy across the street, you know, he was drunk and he was like, yo, you know, I'm now the co garden coordinator. Right, he's outside, we built an urban uh, mini farm across the street, orchard, vineyard, all that type of stuff. Just defying these narratives, like going into the community and having a conversation with the adults. Like, yo, this is what we're gonna do. What's up, y'all wanna get down with the program? Anti-poverty task force got on the citizens advisory board, uh, pushed for social enterprise to be localized versus outsourced to some random company out in wherever. Um, the city now has the Conrad Center Culinary Arts Program because of that push. Like, I was the lone person in the room that said, hell nah, don't send this contract to some guy in California. You need to hire somebody that knows the local ecosystem, that can understand the relationships and all like this and that and the third. And in a weird twist of fate, now I work for Lewis Ginner Botanical Garden. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, this is like a very monochromatic institution. <laughs> so um, 
and meets like this African-centered grassroots activism, right? And the conversation is about how do we work with the community in authentic ways, right? How do we take the truths that have been stifled and pushed to the side by virtue of the dominant culture and engage in the community in authentic ways and say, hey, listen, you know, we don't know your reality, we don't know your story, we don't know your narrative, but your narrative has value and you can determine what needs to happen in your community better than us, right? So Lewis Ginner is in this transformation space where they're looking to expand beyond its walls, but in that expansion is a very deliberate act of working with the community instead of doing for it. And so it's revolutionary to have the number four botanical garden in the country saying that we're gonna go into communities and we're going to empower the individuals to create the change that they see fit, not what Lewis Ginner thinks is the best thing. And so I'm very enthusiastic about that. Um, so in closing, this whole story should tell you, I'm hoping you leave with this, is that um, as you tell your truth, at last you'll know was surprising we're surpassing certainty that the only thing more frightening than speaking your truth, and that is not speaking. Right? And that's been my <laughs> taboo <tabby> story. <laughs> and um, I'm sorry, I thought I had more time, but I kind of got caught up on some points. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, uh, there was a lot of, in your narrative there, there's a lot of different themes that stood out to me. Given that in our audience here, we have a lot of folks that are in um, creative kind of roles. They oftentimes are starting a new project or in the midst of a project and trying to figure out where to pivot to next. Um, and they're, they're creating things from scratch, which you've done several times. Um, what advice would you have for them kind of in those moments, in those creative uh, moments? Um. I think that the best thing for folks to do is kind of like, you know, think big and let them tell you, think as big as possible and let them tell you no, nah, right? Um, and then if they tell you no, nah, like, you know, ask why not, right? Um, that's been my, you know, personal story is like, even if you tell me no, like, I really don't need your help. You know, we're going to do it anyway, but I would like for you to be a part of it. That's kind of like the mindset that I approach all things is like, It'd be great if you get down, but if not, we're gonna do it anyways. Maybe not with you, but you know, how does that work? Let's open it up to uh, some questions for some folks in the audience. I see a hand back over there. Good morning. Um, you always yes. say, you always say the city is schizophrenic. Can you please go into more details about that? Yeah, so capital of the Confederacy, <laughs> right? Um, African burial ground where like they had a parking lot over top of it up until like five, six years ago, right? Um, Monument Avenue full of these Confederate generals, right? But like the Confederacy lost. <laughs> so uh, the, the schizophrenia is even inherent into like our conversations about poverty. Like nobody wants to talk about the deliberate acts that created poverty, redlining, you know, the creation of Interstate 95 that destroyed like a thousand homes in Jackson Ward and Navy Hill. Like, now we're like, oh, well, what are we gonna do about the poverty? We need to give people jobs. Like, bruh, you killed black businesses, like, deliberately. Like, people were like, no to the highway through Jackson Ward, and you're like, yes, for the highway through, uh, through uh, Jackson Ward. So it takes deliberate acts to undo you know, deliberate, you know, cre uh, created, deliberately created problems. Um, so that's schizophrenia. Like, it's like we seem to like not want to look at our history like through a real historically accurate lens, right? We like to sugarcoat it. And I think that's a part of the schizophrenia. When we reconcile that too, we'll be all right. We'll be all right. Audre Lorde is a womanist. Um, uh, author, philosopher. Um, she's the author of a ton of books, African American woman, who her, she's actually um, uh, a queer uh, author. Um, she has a ton of books. I don't want to like, um, I think you should Google some of her works. Um, her truth telling revolves around the ideas of community, love, 
self-care, um, uh, human to human interactions, activism, right? Um, and she's been an inspiration for you know a lot of my philo philosophical frameworks. I saw a lot of people that had nodded their heads you know, for a lot of what you were talking about because they care about our community so much. They might not know what they can do on a regular basis. So like on a weekly basis or even a daily basis, what are some small things that people can do to help bring some of these truths to life or make a change in their community or volunteer at the right place or do the right thing? Um, you know, when people ask me what they can do, I think the first thing I say is, what do you do, right? What is it that you love? What is it that you're passionate about? What is it that you're gonna wake up at three o'clock in the morning thinking about, you know, what would you do when there was nobody there, right? Um, do that, right? And do that to the best of your ability. Um, in terms of conversation about race and class, you know, um, don't be a dick. I, I work for Lewis Ginner. <laughs> Like, I, I, I work at Lewis Dinner, and it's so bizarre. Like, everything that I've been talking about all my career, right, same conversation where I get, I get hired by Lewis Ginner, and now it's like people want to listen, right? It's so bizarre because it's like, yo, when I was grassrooting it, like, you looked at me like I was, like, you know, Nightcrawler, right, with all the scarf starification, right? But now that I work for Lewis Ginner, it's like, oh, yeah, so we could definitely do some things. So it's like, you know, don't be a dick. Like, if it's a good idea, it doesn't matter where it comes from. Like, let's get, let's get it, let's get together and work.